Okay, we'll get started. Uh, we are talking about dynamic watermarking scheme. And the setting is as follows. I have a state evolution equation. I have uh, observation <coughs> no this is zt right this is zt my ut equals to gamma t of xt plus et et is gaussian mean zero variance sigma square wt is gaussian mean zero sigma w square and vt is attacker noise so attacker is adding some noise to my observation this is all scalar system everything is scalar here uh, the state is one dimensional, action is one dimensional, W is one dimensional, V is one dimensional and all that. And we were talking about in the previous class, we talked about two quantities. The first one was ZT plus one minus AZT minus B gamma t z t minus B e t and this is supposed to be distributed according to uh, Gaussian zero sigma square under no attack. And the second one is ZT plus one minus AZT minus under no attack. So this is where we stopped in the previous class. These were the things we discussed and now the question for today's class is to come up with a detection strategy for checking. So this is all the information that the defender has under no attack case. And the cool thing is that the defender knows this part, but the attacker doesn't know this part. So the attacker, attacker doesn't know what the realization ET is. Okay, so we can use any of the attack detection strategy. So all you have to check, the hypothesis test would be, I want to call this something, what should I call it? Let me see what I should call this. I don't want to call it delta, epsilon. Have we used epsilon yet? We probably have not used epsilon. So let me call this epsilon t plus, epsilon t or epsilon t plus one. And let me call this epsilon tilde t plus one. So the hypothesis test would be 
H naught epsilon t t equals to one to capital T is I I D Gaussian with distribution this. This is the defender's hypothesis. Uh, or I should say controller. So this algorithm must run at the controller's end. And then the alternate hypothesis would be is not IID Gaussian. What the attacker knows. So attacker knows that if if it has to come up with a uh, with a VT VT, it has to maintain this particular distribution for this quantity. So epsilon tilde t plus one, it depends on VT, right? It's a function of VT because that affects ZT plus one. So it has to somehow figure out. So it depends not just on VT but also VT plus one. So the attacker is trying to make sure that this particular quantity is as close to this distribution as possible. It can use any sophisticated algorithm, we don't care. We are not thinking from an attacker's perspective here, we are only thinking from the controller's perspective because the controller wants to detect the attack. And what the controller has done is it has forced the correlation between ET and ZT and it is trying to check whether that correlation satisfies this condition or not and, uh, and and if it satisfies the condition then uh, there is no attack if it doesn't satisfy the condition then there is an attack on the system but what I want to show you through this particular expression is that the attacker wants to get as close to this distribution as possible okay that's the attackers goal now Naturally, when you are doing, when you are writing research paper, you are technically supposed to think both from the attacker's perspective and the defender's perspective, but we are not necessarily talking about attacker's perspective here. Now the question for you is how would you check whether a sequence of random variables that you are seeing, it's a scalar random variable, is it, it's IID Gaussian 0 sigma W square. What could be a very simple test? So I know we talked about hypothesis testing, right? And so technically you can use log likelihood, but what's the problem with log likelihood? You need to know the post change distribution if you wanted to use log likelihood based detection scheme. But the problem here is I don't know what the post change distribution is because I'm not making any assumption on VT. Does that make sense? So, so somehow the, you have to come up with a scheme, you have to come up with an algorithm that looks only at the sequence epsilon t and then somehow figures out that okay this looks like a Gaussian distribution with mean zero and variance sigma w square. How would you check? Okay, that's a somewhat complicated scheme, but yes, you can definitely do that. <coughs> Sorry, can you say that again? Right, and 
perfect. So one idea that uh, he has is I'm going to compute the empirical mean of this random variable and the empirical variance of the random variable. We have seen those expressions before in the class. And we will check whether they lie within some bound or not. And if it lies outside the bound, I'm going to raise an alarm. If it is within the bound, I'm not going to do anything. Things look OK. So that's certainly one thing that's doable. And you can come up with, and, and uh, but that's not what's coming from the literature. So this is, once you once you have this hypothesis test, you can come up with any set of conditions to check whether H0 is true or not. So the one that is, if you read the papers on dynamic watermarking, the one that people are mostly using right now, as of today, is the following test statistic. 1 over capital T summation epsilon T square T goes from 1 to capital T is between sigma w square minus uh, some number. I want to put some number. What should I put? Nu. No, nu can get confused with. OK, mu. Yeah, that's fine. And sigma w square plus mu. So they just look at the, the second uh, moment of this random variable or an estimate of the second moment of the random variable. And they are just checking whether it lies within an interval or not. And if it doesn't lie within an interval, then it means that there is an attacker and they raise an alarm. So this is what is used in the papers. But I'm sure you can come up with better detection schemes. This is something that's very, very elementary, uh, I, I, in my opinion. That's, that's completely my opinion. So I think that this is very elementary detection scheme. You can come up with more sophisticated detection scheme. You, one of your friends came up with one, as we were discussing. So this is, this is what the hypothesis test is. Come up with your own scheme to detect whether the hypothesis is true, whether the H0 is true or HA is true. And then corresponding to the test statistics you come up with, you will have some probability of false alarm or mean time between false alarm and mean delay. So all of that is something you will have to just check by hand or through simulation. Now you know how to compute mean delay and mean time between false alarm. I'm sure you have, <laughs> you have done it a lot in assignment one. So, so you will have to do some trial and error with test, setting up the test statistics and then trying to make sure that you have very uh, very high mean time between false alarm and very low mean delay. That's the trade-off we are always trying to make. OK, any question on this dynamic watermarking algorithm for scalar system? I'm going to uh, talk about a very important property of this dynamic watermarking scheme. So let me. So here is my question. How would you measure attack power? So I have this, uh, this, this, this uh, system of equations. This is my attacker's error that the attacker is introducing in my measurement. And I want to come up with a notion of attack power. OK, I want to understand how much attack power the adversary has on my system. What do you think would be a reasonable metric to measure what the attack power is? Power in the sense of like the attacker's control of the system? Yes, you can think of it. So for instance, if I have 50 temperature sensors, but the attacker can only attack one temperature sensor, and the, somehow the sensor is saturated, so it can only change by certain amount of uh, degree, then it has very low power, right? So we kind of understand intuitively what power means, but, but intuition is not good enough. We need to put it in equation. So what do you think would be a good way to measure attack power? So I have an adversary who can, 
who can change all the thermostats in the, uh, I mean, the temperature readings of all the sensors in the building. So somehow that adversary feels very powerful. But I have another adversary which can only change the sensor for sensor reading of one room. So for instance, if I'm the physical adversary and I put my palm on top of the temperature sensor there, I'm a very weak adversary in some sense. So how would you measure the power? So one notion that is widely used in the literature is the following. Vt square. OK, this is the attack power, so average attack power. So Vt square is power at one time step, and then you take the average of it over all time steps. That's the attack power. And so one major result in this area is as follows. I mean, this, this is sort of an elementary result, but it requires a lot of work to prove. Uh, and then after that, of course, there is a series of results that were proved later on. Uh, but but it, it's all based on this particular fact, which I want to let you know. So if zt or epsilon t passes the test, which means h0 is true, Uh, no, if epsilon t passes the test, which is 1 over capital T summation t equals 1 to capital T limit capital T goes to infinity, epsilon t square equals to sigma w square in the limit. So test in the limit capital T goes to infinity, then limit T goes to infinity 1 over capital T is equal to 0. Okay, so what this fact is saying is you ran this hypothesis test, you have infinite number of data points from the past. So of course in, in, in theorems, in mathematical theorems, we say limit t goes to infinity. In reality, this capital T would be only 100 or so. Okay, so depending on the situation, but uh, for t equals to 100 or t equals to 500, you are very close to t equals to infinity case. So, so what this fact is saying is if epsilon t passes the test in the limit, so you have ran this uh, hypothesis test with t goes from 1 to very large number and you are very close to sigma w square, then it implies that the attack power is going to be very, very small. What that means, what this essentially means is that the attacker, if the attacker is persistent, what, what does it mean for the attacker to be persistent? So attacker is attacking at every point of time. So if the attacker is persistent, then this particular term, the attack power is going to be very large because at every point of time, the attacker is changing the reading of the sensor. So the attack power is very large. So Vt is positive, not positive, but it is non-zero at every point of time. 
And so if I take the square and take the average, it has to be strictly positive number. So if the attacker is persistent, it stays in the system, it's changing the reading at every point of time, then, uh, then this term must differ from sigma w square. Or alternatively, if this term is equal to sigma w square or close to sigma w square, then the attack power is actually very, very small. That's what the meaning of this particular result is. In other words, if this is your attack detection strategy and you have a persistent attacker in the system, you will detect it, okay, period. You will be able to detect it because, uh, because of this particular fact. So that's the beauty of dynamic watermarking that you can always detect a persistent attacker in the system using dynamic watermarking scheme. Many of the other schemes that we have talked about so far, which is based on log likelihood test, uh, the attacker can always come up with some way to evade the log likelihood test. And therefore, uh, a persistent attacker may go undetected for very, very long periods of time using the earlier passive detection schemes. But if, when you have active detection scheme, which is dynamic watermarking scheme, you can always detect a persistent attacker in the system. That's another reason why dynamic watermarking scheme is so cool. I mean, it's my favorite scheme, as you might have learned by now. Uh, so, you know, it's really very powerful method. Uh, what I'm not sure about is how many people have actually applied it in real world systems. So if we have like generators and we have gas pipelines and we have building thermal management systems. I don't think anybody has applied dynamic watermarking to detect attackers within the system. So now that you know this, you can actually make a lot of money uh, in the future by developing solutions for different domains. The key issue here is uh, trying to come up with the watermark, ET. So the, the problem that I feel is, is true in the real world setting, like if you want to deploy it for autonomous vehicle situation, you want to pick a noise, ET, which is IID, but at the same time doesn't create a bad experience for the passengers in the vehicle. So that's where the key problem lies. So you have an air, so consider this, you have a, you want to detect whether your steering is attacked or not. But if you keep changing lanes every 10 seconds, it's going to create a bad experience for the passenger. Uh, if you have an aircraft that's flying and you keep changing the, the, the height, altitude of the aircraft, you know, so you go to 38,000 feet, then you come down to 33,000 feet and so on, just to detect an attack, it's going to create a bad experience for the passengers. So that's where the key difficulty lies. In theory, ET has to be IID Gaussian. In practice, you cannot take an IID Gaussian watermark. So the watermark has to be carefully crafted. Now, if you change the watermark, then the hypothesis test is going to change, and therefore the test statistics is going to change. And so, you know, all of that is sort of an open area for investigation. Okay. Any question so far? Yes, please. So if, if H0 is true, yes. this means that there is no attack. Right, with high probability. With high probability. Right, so because you have finite number. Both. Yes, yes. So in, in, in an algorithm, if we are monitoring the power of the attacker, mm -hmm. We should monitor for that and then if this You cannot monitor this at all. There is no way to monitor it because you cannot observe VT. Yeah. The defender the controller doesn't know what VT is. So how why I mean All this is saying is that if you have a persistent attacker, you will detect it in the limit. Okay, okay. And all I'm saying is that the limit could be hundred time steps, it could be thousand time steps, depends on the problem. Uh, but you will be able to detect a persistent attacker in the system using dynamic watermarking. So this is, this is saying if something happens, then something happens. So you can take the contrapositive statement. If this is greater than zero, then this condition will not hold true. So eventually you will detect the attack. <coughs>
Any other question? So the problem is that how do you how do you check for HA? That's the problem. You cannot come up with a test statistics that tests for non-IID Gaussian zero sigma w square. That's a very difficult problem to solve. So that's why you come up with a simpler detection scheme that only checks whether H naught is true or not, rather than checking whether HA is true or not. Any other question? Okay. Um, this, this second equation, if the attacker uh, uh, achieves this uh, uh, zero mean and this, uh, right? It means this mean. What does that mean? It doesn't mean that it, he will be able to attack unnoticeable, like he will be unnoticeable. If he the, yeah. So this fact is saying this is what you would think. So if I hadn't told you this fact, yeah. this is what you would think that if the attacker is able to maintain this condition, yeah. then the attacker will be invisible. Nobody will be able to detect it. Mm -hmm. But this fact is saying that no, 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 that's not the case. If the attacker is persistent, you will be able to detect the attacker. Even though attacker may be as close to this as possible, it doesn't matter. So when, when attacker is very close to this, uh, all I'm saying is it will take, it may take you some more time to detect an attacker. So it's purely a question of mean delay. Like how quickly can you detect versus how much later will you detect? So the, if the attacker is really stealthy and is changing only one reading every 10 seconds, it's very difficult to detect the attack, right? Um, and so you will take one year to detect the attack because that's when you will have enough data to confidently say that there is an attacker in the system. So that's what it means So for attacker to be stealthy. It will just increase the mean delay. But you will definitely be able to detect eventually. OK. So now what we are going to do is uh, just, this is a scalar system, easy to understand, nothing fancy going on. So now we are going to go for a vector system with far more complicated dynamics and uh, partial observation, and then we will come up with the dynamic watermarking scheme for, for that setting. Okay, so it's going to be a lot of mathematical equations, but uh, the idea is exactly the same as this one. So let's, let's talk about that. So now my system dynamics is So all of these are vector quantities I want to add a noise, observation noise, so let me put NT. This is the I have used ZT, okay, so I don't want to use ZT, that's fine. Okay. What else? ZT is attacker strategy.
right so this is my setting Okay, so what is the setting here? This is known as partial observation, uh, partial observation case. So this is what the setting is. You have a high dimensional system with the state update given by this, but you cannot measure all the states. You can only measure some of the states using sensors and those measurements are known as YT in this case. So I have a vehicle and I want to know the velocity of the vehicle and I have four states in the, five states in the vehicle. The velocity, so in a vehicle, you have velocity, you have tire one rotation, tire two rotation, tire three rotation, tire four rotation. So you have four rotation sensors and you have one velocity. So you have five velocities sorry, five dimensional state in, a, in the case of a vehicle running on the road. But what all are the sensors? What all things can you measure? Well, you can only measure these four things. You cannot measure the velocity of the vehicle. So your YT comprises of only these four quantities. This is your YT. And so your C matrix would be some combination of like some 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0 kind of matrix to denote the fact that you are only measuring a few of the states and not all the states, okay? <clears throat> now when you have rotation sensors, for various reasons, there will be some small noise in the rotation. So when something says 1700 to RPM, if the rotation sensor is saying 1700 RPM, it doesn't mean that it is at 1700 RPM. It would be something like close to 1695 to 1705 RPM. Okay, so there's some uncertainty. And that uncertainty is typically modeled through an observation noise, NT, where NT is also assumed to be a Gaussian random variable or random vector. And WT, which is the actuation noise, is also considered to be a Gaussian random vector. Uh, don't be too worried about these assumptions because in most situations these assumptions would be satisfied. Uh, most, not all, but most situations. Especially if they are physical systems, these assumptions would be satisfied. Okay. All right, so now the question is, I only know the measurements, but I want to know the state of the system. So what should I do? In these situations, you have to do what is known as filtering, okay? And one of the most widely used filters are Kalman filters. And if you take a course in stochastic processes like 6001, EC 6001 or 7103, you will study Kalman filtering in those classes. So we don't want to study Kalman filtering here, but all I'm going to say is you need to filter the observations in order to get an estimate of the state. So the estimate is given by, is given by x hat t, which is updated as follows, x hat t plus 1 equals to a plus lc x hat t plus b u t minus l y t. L is known as the observer gain.
Okay, and this observer gain is, it basically you can, there is a whole theory, there is a whole set of lectures on how to come up with these observer gains, uh, but that is taught under the umbrella of Kalman filtering. If you're going to a traditional industry, like an aircraft or oil and natural gas kind of industry, there is already enough knowledge to figure out what this observer gain should look like. So you don't really have to design them. They will be given to you as part of your, as part of the system. But if, if you were, uh, let's say you went to an electric vehicle company and you are dealing with a new technology for battery packs, then this thing is not given to you. Then you need to take some course to figure out how to design these observer gains for that particular chemistry of, chemi chemistry of the battery pack. Okay, so this is how we determine the, the estimate of the state. You have A, which you know, B, which you know, UT, which you know, and then C is the observation matrix here, and then L is the observer gain that comes from some supervisor of yours who has done this in the past. And now the control policy, UT, would be K of X hat T plus ET. So ET is the watermark. And this is your gamma of X hat T. So this is your control policy evaluated at the estimate of the state. You don't have the true state, so you replace the true state with the estimate and you implement that policy there. <coughs> and as always, I'm going to assume that ET is a Gaussian random variable, random vector, with mean zero and variance sigma e. Okay, so that's the setting for dynamic watermark. I'm going to make the following two assumptions. So all the noises are IID. The second assumption is the spectral radius rho of A plus BK is less than one. Rho of A plus LC is less than one. So rho means the spectral radius of the matrix. So I'm making an assumption that the spectral radius of A plus BK is less than one and A plus LC is less than one. And once again, as I mentioned, in most situations, if you are in a traditional industry, the K is already determined, the L is already determined, and these conditions are already met. And the noises are IID, that's also something that we frequently uh, assume. And they are, even if they are not really true, it doesn't really hamper the design of the system and, and the, the execution in real time. So these are simplifying assumptions to allow us to get to the final equations. But those equations will still apply, even if some of, not some of these. These two assumptions must be true. But even if this assumption is not true, it should still work. OK. Any, any questions so far on the setting? OK, so as always, uh, the controller has added a private watermark, which is only known to the controller, but not known to the adversary. Uh, the adversary's goal is to come up with, like attack the system persistently. And as we will see, if the attacker is persistent in this case, then 
uh, it will be detected using the algorithm that we will design. So a persistent attacker will always get detected. So we, do, we don't have to worry about it. So, but that's the goal of the attacker, is to attack the observation. And the controller's goal is to come up with a detection scheme so that it can detect whether an adversary is changing the observation noise or not. All right. So let's get into the design of the detection scheme. This is how it's going to proceed. So we will derive a series of expressions, just like we did for the epsilon t case. We'll design a series of observations. And after that, uh, we will come up with very simple detection schemes that are bad. Okay? And then we will come up with a more complicated detection scheme, which is good. So we will just go over all those different uh, detection schemes for H0 and HA in the, in, not in today's class, but maybe I'll upload the lecture for Friday's class and you can go through it. Okay, so I'm going to define delta n to be x hat n minus x n, which is given by Oh, delta t, sorry, I'm going to. So I have delta t plus 1 is updated as a plus lc delta t minus wt pt. And I'm going to define the residual. RT equals to Okay. So this is the residual term. If, if we could measure the state exactly, then this delta t will just be equal to vt. And uh, the C would be identity matrix in that case. So in the previous exam, the previous dynamic watermarking case, we didn't really have to have a observer and so under the no attack situation, this x hat t was exactly equal to x t because if there, is, if there is no attacker, then you can measure the state exactly. So this term were not there in the previous example because we could measure the state exactly uh, under the no attack case. But now these terms are here because now we have a observation, we, we have a filter or we have an estimate of the state based on all the information I've received so far. So there is still some uncertainty between what I have estimated to be the state and what the true state is. So if you think about going back to the rotation example, tire rotation example, uh, I have looked at all the tire rotation sensor readings and I have tried to estimate what the velocity of the vehicle is and what the rotation of the tires are, rotational speed of the tires are. But that may still differ from the actual true state of the system. 
And I know that that difference is going to be very small, but there is still some difference, and that's what I'm trying to measure here with delta t. And so I define this residual term, which is given by this particular expression. Now, just like in the previous case, we considered the case, what happens under no attack? What are we expecting if there is no attacker in the system? So let's look at the no attack case. So then Vt is identically zero at all times. So sigma delta, which is, so remember this is your delta t, and this is x hat nt minus, x hat t minus xt. So this is defined as limit t goes to infinity, expected value of delta t, delta t transpose, <coughs> and it's given by a plus lc sigma delta, it's a fixed point equation. <coughs> sigma n. This should be nt, this should be nt. I hope I have not written zt anywhere else, yeah, okay. So please make a correction. There is no ZT here, it's all NT. I don't want you to confuse between the ZT used previously and NT here. Okay. So my sigma delta, which is the limit as T goes to infinity, the variance, the covariance of it's not actually the covariance, it's a, uh, well, actually delta t is a mean zero random variable, random vector, so this is actually the covariance in the limit. So this is the limiting covariance of delta t, which is the error term, and that's, give, that's given by this particular expression, so sigma delta is equal to something times sigma delta times something transpose plus something else. It's a fixed point equation, and, but you can compute what value of sigma delta would satisfy this expression. There are uh, solvers in MATLAB and in Python and other programming languages to be able to solve this system of equations. Now, we want to find sigma r, which is limit t goes to infinity, expected value of rt RT transpose, and this is given by C sigma delta C transpose plus sigma N. Okay, so here is, the, yeah, you have a question? Actually, delta t is the estimation error, right? That's right. So, residual is the output error. So, residual is this quantity. That is output. Output, output uh, based on my estimate minus the actual measurement that I'm getting. Well, yeah, you can call it observation error or something, whatever you want to call it. So this is, this is the estimate of the observation and this is the true observation you are getting, right? That's residual and that's what you are tracking. Any other question? I should maybe box it here, this whole thing. So the residual is C times the estimate minus the actual uh, observation that I made, the actual 
output from the sensors. Okay. So let's let's do the following. Uh, I have. I have the system knowledge, I have the observation design, observer design and all that stuff is done. Uh, I'm assuming that there is no attacker in the system. Uh, based on all the parameters that I know of, uh, I can compute sigma delta by using some of the existing solvers uh, available online for solving this kind of equation. So I will do that and based on that output of sigma delta, I'll plug it in here and I will compute sigma r which is the covariance of the residual. And then I am going to define R bar n, R bar t, which is normalized, normalized uh, uh, value of the residual R t. One thing I want to note is when there is no attack in the system when Vt is identically zero, all of these are Gaussian random vectors and this one becomes a Gaussian random vector with identity uh, covariance because of the normalization done here. So R bar T is Gaussian with mean zero and covariance identity. Minus half, minus half. Okay, yes. In this equation, you have like uh, sigma delta in both sides. That's right. So, so to calculate it. Yeah, you have like solvers that can calculate this kind of. So the way the solver works is it computes a sigma delta greater than zero. Sigma delta, which is a positive definite matrix that satisfies the system of equations. And there are calculators like solvers available in, in various programming languages to do that. And those matrices are definitely invertible because? Right, because you have assumed that sigma delta has to be strictly positive definite. That's how you try to solve this system of equations. Right, and so if sigma delta is invertible, then this is an invertible matrix, and, and so this inversion is completely justified. Okay, <laughs> so I guess the time is up, so here is what I'm going to do. I'll upload the video of the hypothesis test, the hypothesis test wants to test whether this R bar t is a Gaussian random variable with mean zero, random vector with mean zero and identity covariance or not. That's the hypothesis test. The, the problem here is R bar t is no longer a IID random, va random vector because of the observer, because of the estimation, now everything is dependent on the past history, and therefore th this is no longer a IID Gaussian vector. But that's okay, uh, we will come up with detection schemes, some bad detection schemes and some good detection schemes to have this, to test this hypothesis, where H naught is R bar T is Gaussian, and the second one is R bar T is not. N zero identity, okay? So this is what I'm going to do in the next class. I'll record the video and I'll upload it. That would be covered, that would be my Friday's class. And then next Monday, we'll talk about some new topic for detection schemes. So thank you.